Hey everyone, this is part two of our lecture for uh, international relations class on Hart and Negri's multitude. We're talking about, uh, or we were just talking about uh, their concept of empire, and we delineated some very important concepts there um, that, that contribute to their theorization of empire. Um, we talked at some length about the transformation of labor today from being a labor that is, uh, well, some would say Fordist in nature, where we were just uh, putting uh, rivets on um, machines and that kind of thing, doing very sort of physical work. This is the work that uh, Marx identified in the 19th century, it was the same work that people were doing more or less at the start of the last century. Uh, and we've discussed a change in the nature of labor from the Fordist era to the post Fordist era, where now it seems the goods and services that we're selling are immaterial in their nature, right? Which means that they're either knowledge based or that they are effective meaning that they're based on our ability to generate emotional connections with people. Uh, we talked about the Nike swoosh in class, we talked about the sex chat phone worker, we talked about how um, much of the production that we do in our society today is based on our ability to generate emotional linkages with the consumer. Because the consumer, um, of course, in turning towards um, uh, uh, emotional products, so to speak, are non-linear uh, are qualitative products as opposed to quantitative products. Uh, different sorts of language you can use there to describe this transformation. But um, the, the problem is, of course, that this person uh, ends up uh, having somehow to produce their own experience, right? You know, the, the satisfaction I get from wearing a Nike running shoe isn't something that Nike gives to me. It's something that I make for myself when I put the shoe on. How can Nike can't actually produce that feeling in me. I have to produce that feeling in it for, in me for myself. Same thing for the sex chat phone line consumer, right? So we use the term in class, uh, if not in the slide, and not in the the last YouTube, but but we can discuss uh, uh, the concept of the prosumer, for example, the producer consumer, the person who is in consuming also producing their own emotional feeling, and the the goal of the worker in that context is to facilitate and assist the consumer in the uh, creation of that feeling. So that's to do with effective labor and then we also talked about intellectual labor, informational labor, uh, the fact that so many of us are working with computers and things today doing advanced scientific kind of work that, that previous worker cl working class people would never have done previously. Um, what's in common we discussed in the last uh, YouTube uh, with both of these sorts of phenomena um, these, uh, whether it's effective or um, agricultural or uh, whatever, right, is that it's, it's, it's drawing on what Hart and Negri call open science. These are things, types of knowledge that uh, were never really owned before. Uh, science today is not uh, like it used to be, of course. It's, it's increasingly becoming commodified and commercialized and copyrighted and trademarked and owned, but um, actually that's a difficult kind of thing to do because if you if you understand the history of science it's it's pretty much been a lot of open source uh, work uh, throughout the ages and the decades and the millennia so um, there's definitely a, a change there in that sense. So um, one of the last concepts we discussed was the common. We, we asked so well if, if capitalism doesn't exploit us um, in the workplace anymore, in the factory so to speak, then uh, it's possible that it's exploiting us in another sense. It's not, it's not so much stealing um, the surplus profit from us anymore, although indeed it is still doing that um, in many ways, um, but it's also taking from us our ability to control this thing that Hart and Negri call the common, which, uh, as we remember, we just talked about open science. Um, that's part of the common, right? The common, the commons, the, the common good sometimes also refers to the environment, but as we're using it here, it refers to language, it refers to our capacities and skills to engage in emotional care for each other, um, it refers to um, our ability to plow a field and raise um, plants, it refers to, um, well, my goodness, so many different types of things really. Um, so the thing we need to sort of keep in mind there is that these things are being commercialized today and commodified, copyrighted, etc. And so um, one of the things that seems to be going on for Hart and Negri is that 
as these things become privatized and owned, that means they cease to be public knowledge, they cease to be public information, and we lose our control over them, right? So um, when Hart and Negri um, find that we rely on the common and the products themselves, the products of the uh, that, that, that capitalism sells today are based on the common, are, are, are insofar as they're social, they're based on the common, um, we also know in the same instance that the techniques and abilities to use and manipulate the common are being uh, copyrighted and trademarked. So that's that's kind of a problem for them because they see that as a kind of an undermining of democracy, an undermining of our ability to, to control our own means of existence. Um, and um, ultimately in a world where you see so many things going on where uh, we have financial crises, where we have environmental crises, where we have um, very expensive health care and all these sorts of things, um, where we have genetically altered seeds, uh, where we have the government rubber stamping the genetic alteration of seeds and the use of those seeds in our fields without us being told as consumers what's going on, you start to see some of the stakes of this privatization of the common of this um, sort of cruel, in if you way, de-democratization of the common. Hart and Negri are fundamentally opposed to this. And so when they ask uh, what the struggle of the multitude is, it's primarily um, to do with this, this um, struggle for the common. So we just mentioned the word multitude, and now we should start on the slide here that we have before us, because uh, that's where we're starting our, le our part two of our lecture here. Um, uh, let me just, as a preface, before we get started here, say that, you know, Cynthia Weber, as we'll see later on in this part of the lecture, one of the accusations Cynthia Weber says is that, well, okay, look, at the end of the day, uh, this pursuit of the common, this sort of, isn't it a material struggle at the end of the day? And if, it, and if it's a material struggle, aren't you guys just Marxists at the end of the day? Aren't you doing the same thing Marx did? Aren't you reducing history? Uh, you may be using different language, you may be saying it's the proletariat versus, excuse me, you may be saying it's the multitude versus empire, whereas Marx said it's the proletariat versus capitalism. But at the end of the day, isn't it the same kind of thing? And, and aren't you suggesting that the next step in history is for the multitude to become aware of itself and sort of rise up and conquer empire? And the question is... Um, whether Cynthia Weber is correct in making that accusation. It's a very, it's a very important accusation. Uh, if she's right, then it means that Hart and Negri are more Marxist than they want to be. Um, but if she's wrong, it's important to ask why she might be wrong and what would be at stake in retaining this idea that Hart and Negri are not in fact Marxist, but they are neo-Marxist, which is different. Um, because, and I'll, and I'll give you kind of a heads up here, if you're taking your bath tonight and your rubber ducky asks you what you learned in school today, here's here's the bottom line. Um, what's going to determine whether Cynthia Weber is right or wrong here is whether she can successfully make the claim, despite what Hart and Negri say, that the multitude is in fact one class or one entity, um, that it is a unified phenomena made of, um, how should we say, uh, that, that it is in fact a, a subjectivity Right, that it is in fact um, a, a body of like-minded people who have a common struggle. Hart and Negri, however, for their part, say in their work time and time again that what they mean by multitude is a body of different people drawn together by a common experience of alienation and disempowerment. And they don't really want to um, uh, sort of say that the only thing motivating this class is a is a is a working class type type struggle. The the multitude is more than the proletariat. It is a diversity of very, very different types of identities and struggles, uni united by a common experience. But at the end of the day, um Hart and Negri are saying that such is the development of empire today, that a victory in the pursuit of the common would benefit all of these different people in this alliance, if you will regardless of the fact that at the end of the day their struggles are somewhat slightly different. The struggle of the racial minorities, not the struggle of the gender minority, etc. Um, and the struggle of the working class um, subjectified person is not the same as, as the homosexually subjectified person. So um, 
so there is a lot going on there. If 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 Cynthia Weber is right, then Hart and Negri are dialectical at the end of the day, right? Um, there is a subject that wins at the end of the day. But I, I, if you read them carefully, they believe that there is no subject that wins at the end of the day, that there is just this multitude. And, and here's the thing, you know, um, the, the multitude at the end of the day sort of wants to disband itself, right? It, it wants to uh, put itself out of business because when it wins, it doesn't really need to exist anymore. Um, and, and that's when we move on to a different type of history, uh, hopefully a more democratic uh, regime. Um, so, okay, um, what's going on with the multitude then? Let's start here. We have um, in uh, the, the numbers here refer to Hart and Negri's book called Multitude, and you don't have that book as an assigned reading in this class, but if ever you're interested in going to look look at that book, here are the numbers and some page numbers for you that you can look at if you want to do more research. So, first of all, Hart and Negri talk about the multitude and define it. They contrast it with, with various other concepts that we sometimes use in political science. The people, the crowd, the masses, um, all these other concepts, of course, have their merits and have their flaws. But Hart and Negri seem to suggest that, in a way, the people, the crowd, the masses, they're all too generalizing. And in a way, they're kind of passive concepts, especially that concept, the masses, because the people, the crowd, the masses, they can all be kind of misled, they can all be kind of um, uh, manipulated politically, or they're just too damn similar, they're too damn alike to each other. And Hart and Negri are looking for a concept, as I was arguing in the introduction to this slide, um, that accommodates difference. So for Hart and Negri, the multitude is a difference that remains different, um, a difference that once it comes together as a group, remains different. And, I, and for me, that's a very strong suggestion that Cynthia Weber is barking up the wrong tree when she says that Hart and Negri are trying to make everything into one big conflict, one big struggle. Um, in fact, if you are interested, there's, a, there's, if we can talk about it, or I can post it on the Blackboard page a whole other time. But um, there's, there's debates where Hart and Negri gets stuck into this question with people, for example, with David Harvey, who's a well-known Marxist geographer. He accuses them of the same kind of thing that Cynthia Weber says, and, and uh, except that he is actually is a, is a Marxist and says that they're not being Marxist enough, and they're basically saying, no, 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 no. Like, you know, so you, it's weird because on the one hand, you've got Cynthia Weber saying that they're too reductive, they're too Marxist, that the multitude is a reductive concept, and on the other hand, you've got the actual old-school Marxists saying that they're not reductive enough, that they don't give due preference to the working class, or the struggle of the working class against the capitalists. So so that is always kind of a, a, a an alert sign there when you see that kind of a debate going on. Um, um, so, so the multitude is a collection of all these different types of struggles. It's a very new left type phenomena. We discussed the emergence of the new left as being the body that got of people that got frustrated in the late sixties with the failure of the communist party to represent um, the people in the struggle with 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 power. Uh, the communist party had been kind of co opted in Europe even though it was very powerful, it, it had decided to become what was known at the time as Euro-Communist, which was to break ranks with the Soviet Union and to sort of fall into line with the Western Liberal Democratic Project and to hope for a more sort of slow-paced, non-violent, communistic progression uh, of, of its agenda, uh, a progression of the communistic agenda in, in the European context over time. Um, and, and people got very upset with that. And they felt ultimately at the end of the day that they'd been betrayed. So, and, and besides, anyway, they were saying, with all these other new sorts of struggles becoming apparent now, the struggle of women, the struggle of, of racial minorities, uh, the struggle of the youth against paternalistic government, um, there was perhaps a need for a more identity based struggle as opposed to a materially based struggle. So, um, the multitude respects is a concept with Hart and Negri uh, innovate to respect all those differences that emerged in the 1960s, the struggles of all those different categories, without doing what the Marxists did, which is lump them all into the same category of the proletariat and say there's only one struggle, that's the pro pro struggle against the capitalist. Here we have Hart and Negri saying there's actually a diversity of struggles, but they all have a common problem, despite the fact that they have singular and individual problems as well, they have a common problem insofar as in an age of globalization and complexity, 
one thing that seems to be going on for sure is that capitalism is disempowering us from our ability to own and democratically decide uh, upon the distribution of what they call the commonwealth okay and if the commonwealth is being abused none of these differences can really be empowered at the end of the day you know sure women might get ahead in the workplace but it's it's still a workplace that's set up along capitalistic lines and it's still damaging the environment for example so um, it's damaging the air that we breathe uh, it's 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 preventing uh, and in fact uh, co-opting uh, excuse me co-opting um, much of 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 the 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 I got to be careful with my words here. What I'm trying to say is something along the lines of, it's it capitalism today is, is sort of subsuming or co-opting uh, women um, in in a manner that uh, you know doesn't really respect the feminist agenda. For example, of of care, um, of concern, of of putting emotions at the center of what we do as a species, as opposed to you know, this sort of cold, stoical, capitalist agenda. You can see this, actually, this is a total digression here, but you can see this very clearly right now in the debate over the um, the lady that works for um, for Facebook, um, Mark Zuckerberg's um, uh, CEO there. Um, she's been um, talking about uh, how you should lean in to your business and forget your feminine values um, uh, you know, and, and sort of work harder than men in order to get ahead. And, and women should not be afraid to work harder than men to get ahead. And there you go, you see sort of classic case in point of how, how in the name of feminism, a very non-feministic agenda is being served. And so that's, that's a, definitely a big problem. So, um, capitalism today is, 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 is a tricky proposition for feminists in that sense because it, it it seems there's two different pathways you can pursue you can try to forward the agenda of women within the capital system or you can try to say that the capital system itself actually disempowers and 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 undermines the cause of feminism in the much more broader sense of trying to create a world that's not based on masculine values but a world that's based on feminine values of nurturing and care um so so after all that Hart and Negri make the controversial remark that the multitude is indeed a class, right? Um, well, they say, how else would you call it, right? It's, it's, it is all these differences that remain different once they're constituted as the multitude, right? Because they're bound by these common experiences of disempowerment and alienation and disenfranchisement in their, in their democratic ownership of the common. But, but in that common, common predicament that they experience, they are a class. They are within and they are also against global capitalism. Um, uh, we live in a globalized society now, and there's no escaping global capitalism. So uh, wherever you see biopolitical production, which is pretty much everywhere now, um, you have um, <clears throat> you have this this experience of common domination, and uh, and so this makes things possible, right? You can look around the world and see how. Um, different types of peoples uh, express their resistance to this type of capitalism and when multitude was written of course this would have been a very abstract type of proposition but multitude uh, was written a lot a long time before uh, the Occupy Wall Street phenomena and the Arab Spring in more recent work hard and we have looked at the Arab Spring and the Occupy Wall Street phenomena, even though they're very, very different, and of course the Chilean student movement and the Canadian students movement and various other things like that, and and they've tried to argue that in fact these are great case studies in showing how, despite um, the different locations that people have, there are struggles in common. Um, the the Hardin agree, for example, say in the current moment you see um, a struggle. Uh, against uh, political representation. People want direct representation, so that's something they have in common, even though their experiences are very different. Um, they want common uh, control of their um, the, 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 uh, the, the means of life reproduction, as we've talked about in the last slide, the common. Um, they want a democratic and informative media, right? A third thing they have in common. And um, a fourth thing in com they think they have in common would be um, a complete dissatisfaction with the classes that represent them, i.e. representative democracy. If you look at how Occupy Wall Street 
worked, if you look at how the Arab Spring worked, they're all based in horizontal politics that look very much like anarchist ways of organizing. And so it, it's this idea of the General Assembly, the anarchistic style General Assembly, um, in their preference for that kind of work as opposed to like a vertically integrated union or a vertically integrated protest group or a vertically integrated military group even or a paramilitary group. Um, they've rejected all of that and they've chosen the network form. Uh, and in embracing the network form, they've gone horizontal, and that speaks to the fact that with the type of technologies that we have today, it's easier for people to, to represent their own points of view directly in parliamentary type conjectures. Why would you vote for someone when you can just represent your own point of view through through the computer network or through the direct encounter with other people in a general assembly type model? So, so that those different types of things definitely suggest to Hart and Negri that there's there's there is there are common uh, um, um, concerns in this diverse experience of life in postmodern capitalism. So um, this is why they say, uh, you know, okay, you know, class, the concept of class to a certain extent, it is reductive, and and as it's used by the mainstream Marxists, for example, it is very reductive. It means only the proletariat, but. They also say that it's it's political, right? And that it's that it's in other words, it's it, that the term class is to do with um, the desire to create a certain type of world. And it's not just that we are a subject that exists, we are a subject that doesn't even exist yet. The multitude doesn't actually, self-conscientiously anyway, exist. So in that sense, the term class is a political project. It desires, it's a, it's a, it's a term that we're using because we desire to bring this multitude class into existence. So we have to look at the experience of these different types of classes in their common predicament and then and in so doing identify what they say is the lines of collective resistance to power. So that's the actual experience we have today but in the same breath thinking about the future, thinking about the fact that um, what we're hoping for here regardless of whether we're you know poor, working class, farmer, peasant, young, old, male, female, gay, straight, it doesn't matter. What we're all looking forward to here, the, the thing that's holding us back and the thing that we must struggle for that allows us to become fully expressed in the identity that we choose to have for ourselves, as, as they say, is this struggle, right? And they say, from the struggle against nature toward the surplus and abundance of human productivity, um, uh, enough for all. And that is a very Marxist idea, of course. Um, but just to keep in mind that it's not just the struggle of the proletariat, it's the struggle of everyone and all these different types of people. Um, now, what we'll be discussing later, as I mentioned earlier on, is, is this question that Cynthia Weber raises. Is that just one struggle? Is it, is it, is, does that mean there's only one thing going on in our current moment from Hart Negri's point of view? If she's right, then, then Hart and Negri are guilty of dialectic thinking. If, if she's wrong, then, then they are somewhat self-justified in saying that they're not dialectical, or at least non-teleological, as they say, in their way of thinking. But we'll cover some of these terms later. So, so who is in then? Who are, or might even ask, who's not in? But they say that no, there's no political priority among all the different forms of labor. All forms of labor are today socially productive. And they see all these different groups that we've been discussing about as each sort of doing the labor. Because remember, as we've said, the ca the factory is everywhere today. We don't just get exploited in the factory anymore. We get exploited throughout our entire society um, because of the way the common has been withdrawn from us. Our control and our administration of the common has been uh, subsumed into capitalist uh, hierarchy. So, um, well, hopefully this is all making some sense. So let's talk about the Occupy movement here now for a second, because that's an interesting case study of something that um, uh, that uh, you know seems relevant to to Hart and Negri's uh, um, project here, and they've talked about it at length. Now, um, part of the trajectory of this uh, this organization, the the the, the, the multitude. Um, you can see it emerging in 1999 with the so-called Battle of Seattle, where Famously, turtles and teamsters came together on the streets to protest against the de-democratization of the control of the global trading system at the World Trade Organization meetings in Seattle in 1999. And what the various people they wanted to do, they called them turtles and teamsters because they were environmentalists and unionists uh, at the same time. Unionists might not be 
the term there, more union representatives or, or organized labor might be a better term. Um, uh, so, so what, um, what, what uh, would these different groups have found in common with each other, such that they would be able to march under the same banner and protest at the WTO? Well, says uh, Hart and Negri, um, certainly it's true that organized labor traditionally is interested in protecting jobs, and the, the, the environmentalists are interested in protecting the environment. But those two things don't normally go hand in hand. Oftentimes those things are clashing um, because protecting jobs can sometimes mean protecting industries that pollute and protecting the environment can sometimes mean wanting to shut those industries down and in, at the expense of jobs. So how the hell do you have at the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle this multitudinous moment of the coming together of these two very, very different types of people and them holding hands and protesting against something that looks like a globally dominant logic of government whereby in the World Trade Organization um, laws pertaining to both and offensive to both were being discussed and so much so in fact that the, 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 the environmentalists and the Teamsters were finding common cause. So um, partially this is to do with the fact that we live in an age of neoliberalism and neoliberalism, of course, is the logic that the market should be the thing making all the decisions today. And so in globalization, then, as a result of this logic of neoliberalism, um, America has been losing, for example, tr its traditional manufacturing jobs as those jobs have moved to the cheapest countries where the labor is cheapest. Um, we have global free trade now, you see, uh, because of the logic of free markets. And some of that logic, of course, is beneficial and good. But... Um, you know, where it hurts people, understandably, they would uh, be resentful because they're losing their jobs. Um, similarly, the environmentalists find that in this sort of mad rush of countries to make their labor costs cheaper and to lower the costs to employers in their countries, um, certain things like environmental standards are being cut and uh, are, are alternatively they're just not being enforced and so um, there's a problem with globalization from an environmentalist perspective as well so here come these different diverse people this multitude if you will not claiming that globalization is so much a bad thing but that it's not being done correctly it's not being done democratically so some people call these people the anti-globalization movement but from Hart and Negri's perspective they're not anti-globalization they're alter globalization they're looking for a different globalization so not anti but alter globalization A-L-T-E-R um, so so that's the problem really um, from that point of view that that the, the, the free market logic has sort of catalyzed the emer emergence of the multitude and the multitude doesn't always stick around say Hart and Negri it's like a mole it burrowing underground. It surfaces from time to time. It doesn't mean it's not there. Sometimes it's burrowing away, preparing, doing things in its burrows, um, but then spontaneously, and sometimes without us being quite aware of why, the mole suddenly emerges. It jumps up from underground and um, it, uh, it, it appears on the scene. Um, and it did so in Seattle. It's done so at various different times since Seattle, but most certainly it's done so in the context of Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring. So um, Cynthia Weber's argument here um, is uh, that uh, Hart and Negri are very useful in some ways insofar as they inject a new argument into the Seattle debate. Um, Many people, uh, as she argues, would have seen these these sort of Seattle protesters as just bored hippies or bored hipsters or whatever, right? Um, not really having a very valid politics after all. Um, remember, both Cynthia Weber and Hardin Negri are both interested in challenging Francis Fukuyama, but they're doing it slightly differently. I think Cynthia Weber is more persuaded by this idea, if we remember her comments from uh, talking about the Truman Show, she is genuinely worried that people are bored, I think, and that they have sort of, basically, that consumerism has not been enough for them. Uh, whereas Hart and Negri, I think, are genuinely concerned about the fact that there are, uh, there is this abuse of the common uh, going on, um, that poverty still exists, among other things. And there's all this diversity of struggles going on against the background of globalized capitalism. Um, 
So, you know, uh, definitely the political stakes are different for these two people. But but that doesn't say Cynthia Weber can't respect Hardenegger for what they're trying to do. Um, so to Cynthia Weber, then, Hardenegger's project is to, is, is, is to unify postmodern ontology, all these different struggles, with this neo-Marxist dialectic, to take all these different struggles and say that amongst them, in common, they all have in common this struggle against uh, today's capitalistic logic, um, of biopolitical exploitation and hopefully in saying biopolitical exploitation having watched the last hour and then this hour hopefully you're now clear what I mean when I say that this is the type of post Fordist uh, exploitation that's going on today where we're being denied access to control of the commonwealth um, and that's something that affects everyone uh, equally um, regardless of whether their proletariat are feminine or are feminine, proletariat are female uh, or are, are, are a racial minority or what have you, right? So um, <clears throat> this is the complicated bit for me. Um, uh, her challenge to Hart and Negri is because she sees it as just one clash is to say that just because they say that the multitude exists doesn't necessarily make it so, right? The multitude, obviously, and you and I can recognize this quite easily ourselves. I mean, we don't look around us and see the multitude appearing anytime soon, right? Um, sure, there was Occupy Wall Street and little bits and pieces that are still going on. But, you know, it seems that these things have short lifespans. And Hart and Negri are maybe investing a lot of optimistic hope in the idea that this thing might come into existence at some time very soon um, but um, haha so one of the things I can do making these videos is I can cheat and when I see a typo on my slide I can stop the video change the slide and then get back to you so hopefully you've spotted the deliberate mistake here um, on the pre the way the slide previously was at the bottom of the the, the leftmost column here I had um, a rather poorly phrased claim and I think I've fixed that now uh, because the conclusion of, of Cynthia Weber's critique of Hart and Negri is, is that, you know, um, it's, it, 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 there's, there's, there's no way to um, imagine how something like the multitude, which doesn't really exist historically speaking, can suddenly just like fabricate itself out of thin air, right? How are all these different groups going to find unity in each other um, and still maintain their difference. Uh, she's very, very dubious. And so she, I think, I think possibly because she, it's because she believes that really at the center of the human project, um, there isn't really anything there. There's all we are from Weber's point of view is identity, right? And identity is a matter of representation. We just constantly representing and re-representing ourselves. So, so Cynthia Weber doesn't really think that there's, enough there to persuade us. There's not really enough tradition, if you will. There's not a cultural tradition of thinking about ourselves as a multitude. So it's just not likely to emerge anytime soon. But I think possibly um, Cynthia Weber is overstating the case a little bit because Hart and Negri are different to Cynthia Weber. They're not identity theorists, or they're not just identity theorists. They are people who believe in the fact that human beings are materially real creatures with real desires and real passions. And it's because of their attachment to the concept of desire that they believe that there's a unity there, there's a, there's a potential basis, despite all our differences, there's a potential way we can recognize something common to all our experiences together, because we see ourselves as human beings with human desires. And so, Responding to Weber, then, if we turn to that box in the slide, do Hart and Negri pose a single contradiction after all? Well, it's I suppose it's up to you. If you're Cynthia Weber and you believe that um, they don't really respect these differences after all and that that's just a foil and then what they're really after is to create this monolithic thing called a multitude, um, based on some kind of overly aggressive humanism, then, you know, that's fine. Um, you, certainly, it's possible that you could look at it that way. Um, but I think if you wanted to give Hart and Negri a good faith reading, you would understand that many times in their writing, they reject that accusation completely. 
um, they say that it's not a single contradiction, but it's rather the coming together of a group of singular, different singular entities who just happen to have a common problem, right? And so the fact that they identify a common problem and they set out to resolve that common problem um, doesn't necessarily mean that there's only one struggle in history. The, those subsequent subset struggles still go on, right? But um, and 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 they will go on after the victory of the multitude, I would imagine, right? Uh, although Hardenegger, I think, would be optimistic about that. That they would say that solving the problem of the multitude would also probably go a great measure of the way towards solving the problem of the the diverse struggles. Um, but but do you ever solve the problem of the multitude, right? I mean, possibly the multitude is a continuous struggle that goes on and on. Um, it's something that needs to be renewed. Uh, Hart, if not Negri, but Michael Hart himself is very uh, big fan of Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson, as you remember, maybe from your history, said that the Constitution needed to be renewed every seven years. So I think Hart and Negri also have a very open attitude to the Constitution of the multitude as well. So, well, why would Weber think they are dialectical? Well, we've answered this question to a certain extent, but but we we know why she says that she thinks they're dialectical, but why does she feel she has to say they're dialectical. I, I have a suspicion that it's possibly because um, uh, if uh, she doesn't, then it undermines her own intellectual position, because she is a postmodernist at the end of the day. And so as a result of that, um, she has to say that the uh, human ontology is is empty right that that underneath all our various layers of identity right think of a i think the a good metaphor here cynthia weber thinks of human beings as as like onions and if you peel away all the different layers of the onion what's left nothing right because an onion is nothing but its layers but for Hart and Negri, when you peel back the layers of the onion, there is something there. There's desire, right? There's the human, this basic human impulse of desire, which is neither good nor bad, but it is something real that exists. It wants to survive. It wants to be in the world. It wants to express itself into the world. And in that sense, Hart and Negri are, are more poetic, if you will. They're just, they're just, damn it, you know, they're just more idealistic than than Cynthia Weber. They have very, they're very similar in the language they use and in the way they look at the world as being constructed and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the thing that makes Hart and Negri maybe sort of more Marxist is that they believe that, that there's something to struggle for there on behalf of that's human, right? That makes the world better. If we fight for it, it makes the world better. I don't know that I see that in Cynthia Weber. She seems to think that the, the, the goal is to just ever more diligently peel back the layers of the onion and somehow in doing that we make the world a better place but that project never ceases right um and, and at the end of the day you wonder what you're what you're struggling for i mean if she could respond to this video i suppose she would say that there's a lot more to it than that but but um are not that there's a lot more to it than that but that i don't think she would disagree with my representation of what she's saying but she would say that i'm misrepresenting the potential benefits of her approach um, and I, I think I do see the benefits of that approach, but I, what I, what I believe is that it's very hard to turn that into a politics, right? It's very hard to go to the masses <laughs> outside the door here and say, let's fight for the liberation of ourselves as onions that have no real essence. Um, um, <clears throat> and I gotta be careful there because Hart and Negri don't believe in an essence of humanity. Um, that that is somehow as a subject of humanity they believe that humanity has all different kinds of articulations and expressions but that what makes those articulations and expressions possible is this substrate of desire and 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 that is a common experience that we can latch on to as a basis for a struggle um, at least that's how I read them okay and um, that's that's been my conclusion after studying them for for a couple of years um, so in conclusion, um, t if if I were to, if you were to put me in a in a spot and, and get me to offer a conclusion here, I I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't understand why why Cynthia Weber thinks the only thing that that there is to humanity is identity, um, because I think there uh, the, the the thing about identity is that if you sort of make it the sole focus of your politics, um, you can end up just focusing on identity as a sort of a 
as a thing that needs to be destroyed or as a thing that needs to be decoded or uh, de-resolved um, in order to somehow produce a freedom of thinking or a freedom of thought. And um, it, it's just not clear at what point you would stop in that process, right? I mean, um, uh, freedom of thought for what, right? And and, and that, I guess that's the question I have, which I feel Hart and Egri do a much better job of answering at the end of the day, despite the fact that there's there's problems there. I think I, I actually do agree with Cynthia Weber. Uh, she doesn't quite say it, but she implies it, that there's a lot of optimism in Hart and Negri, and I think that's a major problem. I think um, they sort of naively expect the multitude to fully emerge one of these days, and I'm not sure why or how that's going to happen without some kind of like tuition or, or, or teaching phenomena that would actually bring them into full expression. Um, and I and I, I I think they would probably worry that I would say that, but um, sometimes I feel like Hart and Egger are just saying you know that the solution is just to to wait. They, they, they but you know there's urgent problems right. There's global warming and there's all these urgent things that we have to deal with on the planet, and I'm not sure that just waiting for the emergence of the multitude, waiting for this mole to burrow up from underground again, is going to be uh, the solution that we that we seek. Now, when you're looking at the film Memento, actually I find it a very fascinating movie to choose by Cynthia Weber for this purposes of this discussion. I'm, I'm really impressed that she chose this film, and every time I watch it, I just get more and more perplexed by it and intrigued by it. It's a fantastic film, it's really well acted, it's, it's a kind of a bewildering film in some ways, um, but um, definitely worth the time to think about and study. So it, it, we deal with a guy called Leonard, he's an insurance salesman, uh, he's not an insurance salesman, he's an insurance, uh, he works for an underwriter, I guess, he's a, he's a risk assessor, and um, his job is to figure out if people should be denied their claims um, or not in, um, in, in particular types of injuries, and he evaluates um, mental injuries, especially injuries for, for people who have damaged their memory, and ironically, he has an accident himself, um, and he comes to lose his short-term memory as well. And in order to overcome his short-term memory problem, he writes these messages all over his body in tattoos, and he keeps a bundle of notes around himself to constantly remind him um, what, what he, who he is and where he's going. Now, there's a metaphor here, right? Because for Cynthia Weber, what's amazing about the plight of Leonard is it's exactly the same plight as the multitude. And this is why she's dubious about the multitude as an ontological, you know, reality. Because there's nothing really there. There's nothing underneath the layers of the onion, and and to suddenly sort of sort of try to arbitrarily pose one out of thin blue air, right? Um, um, uh, Leonard has the same problem. He doesn't really know who he is. He keeps writing these messages on himself to remind himself uh, what he's got to do, who he's got to be. And um, and he and at the end of the day, he he sort of compromises himself by uh, by uh, you, I won't I, well if I say what I'm about to say, I'll ruin the end of the film for you. So I won't say that. But um, you, th what I will say though is you've got to look from Cindy Weber's point of view. You've got to look at Leonard's method of self authorship in the film. You've got to look at how he um, um, poses himself, how he creates himself as a subject. Yeah, and the question is, can he escape? This method, at the end of the day, can can or rather, can the Methodist help him escape his problem? Can he ever fully imagine himself uh, as as something, and then forget that he's actually imagining it? Can he can he ever become real? I guess he's like Pinocchio. You know, he wants to become a real boy, and he, also the multitude have the same Pinocchio problem. They also want to become a real boy. Um, Weber says no, and you know, actually, I agree with her. Leonard cannot in the movie. The case study that we have in the movie, it's true. Leonard cannot escape his method, and that is because he has brain damage, okay? Now, and I guess that's all I want to say. Is it a fair comparison? Can we look at the problem that Leonard has with his brain damage and say that the real-world multitude has the same problem? Who's to say? Um, will the multitude ever fully come into existence? Personally, I doubt it will ever happen that every human, every human being on the planet suddenly sort of wakes up one day and says, we are the multitude, right? But then again, I don't think that's what Hart and Negri are saying realistically is ever actually going to happen. That's not something that they're holding their, out their breath for, yeah? Um, but, 
but it can happen enough to make a difference and that's what um, they would sort of be inclined to answer I think so um, I don't know that it's a fair comparison it's a fascinating comparison and I'm intrigued by the film and I hope you will be too and I look forward to watching it with you in class or at least excerpts of it uh, when we meet again the next day thanks very much for watching guys and we'll talk to you soon cheers